Stanley, I think I'm right in saying that you once won a poetry prize at Oxford. I did. I won the poetry prize at Oxford. I've got to tell you, this was the new to get prize for poetry, which has been going for about 300 years. Not so often awarded. I was thrilled to get it in 1962 when Robert Graves, very great poet in his own right, was professor of poetry. And he wrote to me and said, mine was the best, and he was going to give me the prize. And from that, I went off to America and became a poet in residence for a while at Iowa State University, Iowa City, Iowa. Goodness, uh, uh, you've never, I don't think, published any poetry. I think you've published 24 books now, but no poetry. Uh, not a book of poetry, that is for sure. I have had poems published in various publications. Um, one little one, for example, about St. Francis of Assisi in a book of poetry which Angela Huth put together. When I say a book of poetry, I mean an anthology, obviously. So yes, it would be nice to produce a book of one's own poems. I think that has maybe got to be the 25th book. Hmm. And when, uh, have you always encouraged your family, your children, for example, did you encourage them to learn poetry and read it? I when think they, they were did young? it. You know something, they did it at school very much. They all went off to school in, you know, in the normal way, about six or seven years old, <laughs> and, and learned. I think they, le they absorbed poetry at school. Yes, I would say there was a certain amount of poetry you know, uh, talking at home, but no, I wouldn't say this was a conscious effort to make them learn poetry by heart, although I know a lot of them do know. Yes, Boris poetry. can recite quite a lot by I heart. think he can do a hundred poems by heart. I think he had a famous contest once with Michael Binion of the Times, mm. who could get through a hundred poems, learning them in two weeks and getting to the end. I don't know who won. <laughs> it's astonishing. So what have you chosen for us today? Well, I've chosen Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson, which does mean a great deal to me, and maybe I'll have a chance to tell you after I've read it. Why don't you read it first? It little profits that an idle king, by this still hearth, among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race, that hoard and sleep and feed, and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees, all times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that love me and alone on shore. And when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name for always roaming with a hungry heart. Much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch, where through glimpse that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe there were life, life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were, for some three sons to store and hoard myself and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a shining star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill his labor, by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods. When I am gone, he works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, there gloom the dark broad seas, my mariners' souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and oppose free hearts and foreheads. You and I are old, old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, 
for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the bars of all the western stars before I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. We are not now that strength which in old days move heaven and earth, but what we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Thank you. It's a wonderful poem. Why do you like it so much? It is a wonderful poem. I suppose when you reach your eighth decade, as I now have reached, I'm halfway through my eighth decade, you do think of Ulysses returning to Ithaca after 20 years on the plains of Troy and saying to himself, well, I'm definitely older than I was, but there's still something for me to do and handing on, if you like, to a new generation, uh, Telemachus. It's very passionate and it has that sense of optimism, doesn't it? Uh, optimism and, and I'd say realism too. That which we are, we are, though I have not that strength, though we are not that strength which once we were yet what we are, we are. So I'd say optimism plus realism, and that maybe is the right attitude at my age. Yes. It's a great feat of imagination by Tennyson to put himself in that. Well, position. I should have found out before coming to you today exactly how old Tennyson was when he wrote that poem. I suspect he must have been getting on a bit. Of course, in those days, you were quite old at 60. Now you're young at 80. I think you mentioned that one poem, St. Francis, you had published. Is that, is that right? I did have it published. and. I've been an environmentalist the whole of my life, and I was rather upset, if you like, by all the efforts which have been made by economists and so on to say the reason to save nature is because of the economic benefits it brings. And my view is that's rather a narrow view of, of nature conservation. So I wrote a poem called St. Perhaps Francis. Say, oh, I will. I'd be very happy to do so. St. Francis of Assisi, who had never heard of ecology, loved birds and beasts and flowers all the same. He spent his hours in prayer and contemplation, believing that God's creation covered all things great and small. St. Francis knew that every animal and plant has a right to life and space, and that each one has its certain place among the other trillions. Nowadays, clever people like Oxford Dons explain that natural stability is linked to biological diversity, and that mankind's own future depends on how we treat our feathered friends. Ecology, they seem to say, is just self-interest, put another way. I wonder what St. Francis would have thought about arguments of that sort. Thank you, I enjoyed that. Where, did, where does that poem appear if we want to get hold of it? Uh, it appears in an anthology of new poetry uh, put together, compiled by Angela Huth, who is a poet in her own right, as well as being a playwright, and she also produced films. So I was very thrilled to be invited to contribute, and this was the one I wrote, having just been, by the way, to a meeting in Assisi, which the World Wildlife Fund organized, where this idea that nature needs to pay its way was very much mooted, and I didn't agree with it.